Not too long ago, we grabbed a group of people here from uh, Journey Church, and we flew to Peru. Uh, we went, landed in Lima, drove about eight hours north on a bus to a little town called Trujillo, where we began to work in a ministry over a few different years uh, to help families who have been um, bitten by poverty and were living, literally living, in a garbage dump where they would salvage through the garbage dump for food, recyclables, and anything that they could sell on the streets. And that was the way they were um, making their living. Their children were with them there, and it was a cycle that was very hard for them to break. And so uh, through a ministry that we were partnering with, uh, we began to build a training center on the edge of the garbage dump, on the edge of town, where families, parents could come, kids could go to a daycare type of a situation, and moms and dads would then be trained in a new skill and find uh, employment inside of the city to get their lives uh, in, on the right path. And, and we were hopeful that that was going to be a great uh, ministry. So we began to build this building. They needed the building, and so we partnered with the local church there and began uh, to construct the building. But first, we had to start with the foundation. The building was to be two stories high, and so the foundation needed to be deep. Uh, this part of Peru is pretty much um, like uh, the area around Yuma, very sandy, um, very, um, uh, uh, very sandy, no plants at all, looks like uh, sand dunes, literally. And so we were like, okay, how are we going to do this? And the local people told us uh, how we should do it. We had to dig at least a four-foot trench, and it had to be at least so wide so that the building would have a good uh, foundation to stand upon. And I don't know if you've ever tried to dig a trench in sand, but it is not an easy thing at all. You dig and then everything falls in around it. So you're constantly trying to wet the sides and working very quickly. And to make matters worse, this was the garbage dump at one point. And so as we were digging, we were digging through trash to get down to the bottom. And uh, over that week or so, we, uh, along with some other churches, were able to build a solid foundation. The next year that we went, they had built the first floor. And then when we went the second time, uh, or the third time, they had built the other floor. And it was exciting to see all of our work uh, uh, be built upon as we built that foundation um, in the first year. Foundations are key. And we knew if we didn't build a, the foundation well, people would not be set free from their poverty. They, they wouldn't be able to get out. We knew if the building didn't stand, then the people wouldn't stand either. And so we wanted to make sure that we did a, a really good job. Today in our text, as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be looking at where the Apostle Paul talks about the importance of a solid foundation and that we have to have in our solid foundation of our faith the resurrection. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, we're going to start in verse 12. Uh, Pastor Johnny, he was up here, and I've mentioned here recently that we had an ordination uh, a process that he went through. And during that ordination process, uh, we asked him, one of our people that were kind of uh, examining him, asked him, hey, Johnny, can you tell me what are the like non-essentials of the faith? Because Christians disagree about all the different things about the faith, but what are the things that are non-essential? Like if you don't believe these, you're probably not a Christian, you're something else. What are those things? And when the individual asked that, I started to make a list in my head, just like you're probably making a list in your head. You know, what are the non-essential or the, 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 the essential things? things, the things you cannot live without. What are those things? And, you know, so I was making my list. There was something in there about the scripture. Uh, there was something in there about the virgin birth. There was something in there about, uh, you, you know, um, prime rib shouldn't be served other than medium. You know, I mean, like the very core doctrines that we hold close uh, to our heart were in there. And right at the top of the list was this passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says that in our short list should be the resurrection, starting in verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has not been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people who should be pitied. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when he says everything has been put under him, it is clear that he doesn't, does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? If I face death every day, yes, and I surely boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought off wild beasts in Ephesus with more than a human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us Eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought. Stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Hey, can we all pray? Can you just join with me? God, thank you. Thank you for bringing Jesus back to life and what that means to us. And God, I pray that as we look at this text this morning, uh, that you would help us to understand uh, what it is that, that you want us to grab out of it, and God, then help it to transform our lives as we walk out from here. And God, may we um, uh, keep in the center of our, of our faith the resurrection, and may we not only keep it in our minds in the center, but also in, the heart, in our hearts in the center, and help it then to empower our lives and to frame our lives in such a way that not only are we living a life pleasing to you, but we are living a life full of hope for the day when you will raise us from the grave as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's talk about the big idea of the passage like we do every week and just kind of see what Paul is trying to say to us and then let that guide us as we walk through this text here this morning. Uh, what Paul is trying to tell us is the resurrection is foundational to life. The resurrection is foundational to our lives in so many ways, and we're going to focus on the ones that Paul talks about here on how the resurrection is indeed foundational. Uh, the church folk were being misled by someone in their church regarding the resurrection. Therefore, Paul outlines for us the importance of the resurrection. That's this week's text. And then as he continues on in chapter 15, he's going to outline for us the actual process that our bodies will go through once we die until we are resurrected anew. So you don't want to miss next week as we look at that step-by-step -step process as to what actually happens to you when you're buried in the ground, or in my case, as I've instructed my wife, left out in the woods uh, on top of the ground. God knows I've taken a lot from the woods. I ought to give something back, so it's a lot cheaper. Just leave me out there. What happens to my body after the animals have their way with it? You know, what happens to me um, in the end? So today, let's look at why the resurrection is important to this life and the next. First, the resurrection is important to our ministry life. Are you involved in a ministry on some level, maybe here in the church or outside of the church? If you are involved in ministry on any level at all, the resurrection is important to your ministry life. Uh, Paul takes this, let's think about it for a second approach, as he recognizes the futility of ministry without the resurrection. He says if there's no resurrection, then Jesus didn't even come back to life. And if Jesus didn't come back to life, then a few things are true. Uh, number one, we have been lying to you all along. There, we should have no credibility in your lives if Jesus was, in fact, not raised from the dead because we have been telling you that he has been raised from the dead. And we have based our theology on Jesus being raised from the dead. So if indeed he hasn't, then we have been liars. And you all have bought into a lie if there is no resurrection. So the resurrection is key because it is the foundation of what we teach. It's the foundation of what we base all of our salvations on. 
And so if there is no resurrection, then we are found to be liars, right? And you have found, are being found to have believed in a lie. When it comes to life, except for with pundits and politicians, integrity is very important in just about every area of our lives, relationship, business, parenting. And when it comes to ministry, integrity is crucial. It's crucial. I had a friend who wanted to start a new church. He was like an assistant pastor at a church and he wanted to strike out on his own. He informed me of his desire to do so and I encouraged him uh, down that path and thought it would be a, a great thing for the kingdom and for him and he had a vision and so he took the vision and he sold it to some people inside of the church. He sold it to some staff members at that church as well and uh, some of the staff and some of the people in the church decided that they would go and they would start this new work and he was pretty young and passionate about the fact that God was going to use him in ways that he wasn't using his current church to reach people and, and so he, he had a lot of fire and, and was pretty excited about doing it. So people bought into it, uh, they jumped on board with him, uh, they uh, gave their time, they gave their talents, they started using their relationship credibility with people in their neighborhoods to try to invite them to be a part of this church, and they actually gave money to this individual so that, they, so that the ministry could go forward and that he could live. And, and while they were in this kind of foundational phase, you know, things were really growing, and he had some pretty good ideas, and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was interesting to watch God begin to form this. Uh, and then one day, something unusual happened. One of the leaders punched the guy in the face, the pastor in the face, and laid him out on the ground. Not your normal strategy for building a church, right? That's like, like not normal. And so we're like, what's going on there? So he came and he talked to me and he said, hey, I just want to let you know that um, the reason why that guy hit me is because I've been having an affair with his wife for months. And I was like, are you kidding me? You've been doing what? And, and, and he was, as his friend, you know, we were friends just talking about it. And um, I remember telling him, I said, dude, I don't know what you think you're doing, but you are not doing ministry. Guys that call people to follow them and ask people to give them their money while they're sleeping with their wives, those are called cult leaders. That's not ministry. That's manipulation. If you don't have integrity in ministry, you got nothing. There's no foundation for your ministry at all. And as you can imagine, it was heartbreaking and discouraging to the individuals who had given themselves over to this vision. He had a lot of great ideas, but ministry is much more than great ideas. It is, you have to have integrity in everything that you do. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, if we don't have the resurrection, then we are liars. And if we are liars, we don't have any ministry at all. You have to have integrity in every single area as you walk forward and live in a transparent way. And we are living in a transparent way before you, Paul says. We, as we looked last week, we're telling you the truth, not made up stuff. You can go ask anybody. The resurrection has taken place. And he was being honest and open, not only with his moral life, but also with his intellectual life. And ministry needs to have integrity. And therefore, the resurrection is an important part of our ministries as well. So if you're in ministry, the resurrection is important to your ministry life. Not only that, but Paul walks on here in the text as you kind of follow along. He goes from talking about ministry, he talks about the forgiven life, that the resurrection is important not only to what we do for God, but about even our ways that we connected with God in the first place. The, the resurrection is central to there. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then he has four words that, that really stood out to me as I was reading. We are still in our sins if Christ has not been raised, then you are still in your sins. Four words that are saying a great deal. We and our ancestors have walked away from God and with a, a heart of rebellion and with actions of rebellion. Everybody since Adam all the way down to us and to our children and our children's children uh, walk in rebellion away from God. The scripture calls this rebellion sin. We have missed the mark that God has set out for us. And because of this, there is all sorts, all sorts of issues that have been created. Uh, sin has been destructive in our souls and in, 
our bodies and in our relationships and even in our thinking and therefore into our behavior. God wants us to live lives different than that, lives that he has originally intended us to live. So he sent Jesus to earth so that Jesus could pay the penalty for those sins. And if you have been around church for a while, you know that we call that what happens there, Good Friday. On Good Friday, the, the redemption of mankind is taking place. That where I should have been, Christ is in my place sacrificing himself so that I can live even though, uh, because he, even though I've sinned because I no longer have to die because he died in my place. There's a substitutionary thing that is going on there. However, the death of Jesus, like all sacrifices, is only good if it is acceptable. If I sacrifice something, but it's not an acceptable sacrifice, then it's not really worthy at all. If Jesus died and wasn't raised, Paul is telling us here, we would be left wondering if the sacrifice that he made on our behalf was really effective, if it was effectual for us. Um, <clears throat> this week, uh, we have been receiving different DVDs from a friend who is converting our old VHS tapes. We don't have any beta tapes. They're all VHS tapes. Converting those, those tapes before they totally deteriorate into uh, DVDs so that we can get them onto a computer or a hard drive. And so he has been making that, that process easy for us here over the last few weeks. And we've been getting those because my daughter Sydney is graduating this year and we wanted to incorporate some of those old kid videos into her graduation video. And so it's been fun to reminisce and to think about, you know, them as my, my kids, as little kids, and to watch them. And, and it's amazing because uh, those of you who are, have been in my shoes or are in my shoes, you watch those videos and you're like, I know I went through it because I'm on the video, but it feels like three or four lifetimes ago, right? Well, one of those video sparked a memory uh, for me here this week. Um, it wasn't on the video, but it definitely brought it back to life. Before we moved to Arizona, when we would visit family down here, we would go and do the only thing that you could do in July when you visited here. We would go to a lake. And so we'd go to a lake, and we'd rent a boat, and we'd spend some time swimming around or doing a tube. And uh, we went to Canyon Lake one time and rented a boat there. And we kind of saw these people on the sides of the, uh, of the canyon that would climb up a little bit and they would jump into the water. And my son, who was little at that point, said, Dad, I want to try that. And I said, that sounds dangerous. Uh, Mom's not going to like it, so we better pull over quickly and get this thing done, you know? And so uh, we pulled over there and him and I jumped in and we swam to the shore. Uh, he had his little life vest on and we got over to the shore and we, we climbed up to where we saw everybody else was climbing up to. And he was scared, and I was too, <laughs> you know, but I'm the dad. I can't be scared. So I, I'm standing there looking over the edge, and I said, okay, buddy, here's the deal. I'm going to jump first, and you watch where I'm going to jump. And you only jump there. You'll see some bubbles. You jump right there. When you see me come up out of the water, you'll know everything is fine, and then you kind of jump right by me, and, and I'll be there in, in case anything goes wrong. But everything is going to be great, I told myself and him. And so I jumped in, and, you know, uh, water goes shooting up your nose and burns, you know, that, that whole thing. And I came up out of the water, happy to be alive. It was great, you know. And I said, okay, come on. And he jumped right away. No hesitation at all. Just totally jumped in. And I think he was able to do that so quickly because he saw that somebody went ahead of him and did it and survived, right? And that's what Paul is telling us here about the resurrection. He's saying Jesus went through it and he came back out the other side and we can have confidence that because he has come back from that death that we will come back from that death that the sacrifice that he made for us is acceptable the resurrection screams that God has accepted the sacrifice and we are indeed set free from our sin amen Sleepy people, I mean, that is some good stuff. This freedom from our sin helps us to live both now and forevermore, which is our next point. Not only does a forgiven life hinge on the resurrection, but eternal life hinges on the resurrection. The resurrection is important for our eternal life. If Christ has not been raised, then we will not be raised in the future either. 
Additionally, we would have no hope for our loved ones who have gone before us if Christ indeed had not been raised from the dead. They would still be stuck in their sins. There would be no hope that we would see them again. In the middle of this text, Paul out for, outlines for us here with broad brush strokes some of the things that take place after we hit the grave and as we go through our process of the resurrection on the other side. We will expound on these in greater detail next week as Paul takes this little subset in the middle here of this passage and expounds on it in the rest of the chapter in chapter 15. But for our sakes right now, we're not going to cover it this week and next week as well. So you have to come to church next week. It's like a, you know, a little teaser here. Uh, like, like there is an order, Paul goes on to say, and as you will see, to plants growing out of the ground, so too there is an order to our lives growing out of the ground and bearing fruit. Uh, right now, I am reaping the, a harvest at my house. We planted tomato, seed, uh, tomato plants back in January. I got tomatoes coming at me from all angles. It is awesome. They taste so good, and we are loving it. Uh, Roma tomatoes and cherry tomatoes, it's just great. And we had to start somewhere before we got the fruit. So too, we are starting somewhere, and when we are raised, uh, we bear the fruit of this resurrection. And you're going to look at that. Uh, we're going to look at that in greater detail next week as we look at the various events that take place and the order uh, that they take place as well. And so you don't want to miss that. But what we have to understand for this morning's purposes is that the resurrection of Jesus is key to our resurrection into eternal life on the other side. If there is no resurrection of Christ, why would we ever think there would be a resurrection of ourselves? If Jesus wasn't good enough to be raised from the dead, why would we think that we would ever be able to be raised from the dead into eternal life? But thanks be to God, Jesus was raised from the dead, and we will be as well. Not only us, but the people who have gone before us, who have given their lives, given their lives to Jesus, surrendered themselves to him, acknowledged his sacrifice on their behalf, we will get to see them again someday. I just hope they're happy to see me too. Eternal life. However, the resurrection is not just useful for then, right? It's useful for now, in our current everyday life as well. The resurrection is important for the life we are living today in our everyday life. In these concluding verses here, um, Paul's, some of Paul's most, I think, quoted words are found. And my guess is parents or leaders have quoted this at one point or another in their lives, and I know that I have on multiple occasions. Uh, there's this quote here where Paul says, bad company corrupts good morals or good character. Have, have any, has anybody in here ever said that to anybody in one form or another? Okay, like six of you, great. Uh, uh, many more of you should. It's a very common quote of the Apostle Paul. Some people quote it without even knowing that Paul said it. But as it turns out, uh, these are not Paul's words at all. But rather, they are a quote from a fourth century Greek play, believe it or not, that Paul uses to get across some truth to the Corinthians, who would have known this quote? Just like if I were to quote some, you know, modern day, so to speak, play, um, you know, you guys would all understand it, and you guys would all recognize it. That's what was going on there. So, you know, if I said to be or not to be, you guys would all recognize that I'm quoting something else, right? If I said I need more cowbell, you guys would all recognize that that is a quote. See, you're laughing, so you recognize that quote as well. Paul is not trying here when he says that bad company corrupts good morals. He is not changing his focus in the text to talk about something um, outside of the context, but he is keeping in line with what he has been saying for this entire chapter. He's not trying to remove our presence or influence from the world. Bad company corrupts good morals. I got to stay away from people who don't think like me. That out there in the world. I, Paul's not saying get away from folks out there who don't think like you. People out there probably don't think like you. You have a different perspective because God has transformed your life. Um, 
what's going on in the world, Paul says, is we need to be influencers of folks and share the love of God with folks. As he's been urging us all the way through this book, he has not changed that stance at all. What Paul is doing, or his point here, is to ensure for us that we limit the influence of people inside of our church circles who profess to love God, yet promote a theology that does not include the facts of the resurrection. If there are people that are so-called brothers and sisters inside that are trying to teach you something other than the basic core elements of the scripture, that are trying to teach you that the resurrection did not happen and it will not happen for you either, then these people should be ignored because that false teaching will not only hurt you in the long run, but it will hurt you right now as well in how you live your life because the resurrection is important to our everyday lives, not just our eternal lives. So Paul goes on to say here, that the resurrection should influence our lives in a few ways. I'm just going to call out two of them. Number one, the resurrection brings meaning to our suffering. Did you see that in the text? The resurrection helps bring meaning to our suffering. Paul had been suffering a lot in his ministry, and what got him through was the fact that he knew anything that he was going through right now would pale in comparison to what he would receive later that he could withstand a lot of things here right now and get through a lot right now because he knew that someday all of his tears would be counted for, that someday all of the suffering would be wiped away, and that he would be able to live even though right now he is dying a little bit. He would be able to live great in the future. So the future gave meaning to his present. Uh, my wife, uh, over the years, has said, we need to make sure that we have something later in the year on the calendar when we're going through a busy time so that I know I can make it through this busy school season because we're going to be on the beach later on in, in the year, you know, and I can endure this be, because of that a lot easier, and I, that same concept is true. When we're going through difficulties in our lives, the resurrection encourages us to know that it will not be like this forever. That no matter what we're going through, God ultimately wins, right? The resurrection is helpful for my suffering. Suffering takes on many, many forms in life. It can come from many sources and many different people. And when we suffer for doing what is right, or when we suffer unjustly we can follow the way of our master through the suffering to the other side of the resurrection we hope for more than just what is upon us we hope for what is in front of us the resurrection not only helps me in my suffering but it also brings meaning uh, to all of my religious pursuits when I was considering following after God or not I had a choice to make. And I very clearly remember thinking, if this is real, then I have to give myself to it. If this isn't real, I don't want to waste my time with it. And I had to decide at that point, is it real or not? And so my early prayer was, God, if you are real, I want to follow you. That was the way that I framed my conversion experience. If you're legit, then I'm in. If you're not legit, then I don't want to waste my time. I got other things that I could be doing other than following a useless religion. The resurrection brings meaning to our religious pursuits. Now, I've got to be honest with you, there's a couple verses in this part of the passage that I don't understand. I've looked at a bunch of different commentaries on it. I've talked to people that are way smarter than I, and I, none of them understand it either, or if they say they understand it, it still doesn't make any sense to me. And so I'm just going to be honest, I don't know what, what the heck is going on in, in Corinth here that th this would be going on. But apparently, as you can see, there are people inside of Corinth who are being baptized uh, by way of proxy for another individual who has, died, um, who has died before they could get baptized. So it'd be like me getting baptized for my grandparents who are all passed, uh, that somehow they were going through this process of being baptized for the dead. 
Um, I've tried to look at it dramatically and see if they could be saying something else, but Paul just acknowledges this. He says, listen, why would you, um, why would you baptize other people for dead people if there was no resurrection? Why worry about it because they're dead and gone? It's a wasted religious practice. What puzzles me, quite honestly, is I wish Paul would say, and by the way, that's just stupid. Don't do that because it has no meaning at all. Right? Wouldn't that, like that would fit. This is the only time in the entire Bible where anybody gives any type of a hint that baptism for the dead is okay. He doesn't say it's okay, but he doesn't say it's not okay. Right? And so I don't understand why he doesn't just come out and say, this is silly. Uh, but putting that aside for a second, what we can glean from it is Paul is saying, you shouldn't do things in your religious practice that have no meaning behind them. And if you strip the resurrection out of Christianity, most of what we do doesn't make any sense at all. At all. <laughs> Baptism that celebrates the new life we have in Christ and our connection to the resurrection makes no sense without the resurrection of Jesus. Easter celebrating the resurrection of Jesus? Why do we do that if it didn't happen? Christmas, the arrival of the living one, if he has, is not living anymore, why do we continue to celebrate his birth like it is, like he is living? Uh, prayer in Jesus' name, you know, at the end of your prayers you say in Jesus' name, you have no credibility to stand upon because Jesus is no longer around, why do you do it? And then Paul adds the pursuit of holiness. If the grave is the end, he says, live any way you want to, because you only have these lives to live after all. Party, hardy, for you are going to die at some point, and you're going to have no life after it. But if the resurrection is real, if the new life, there is a new life waiting for us, and how we live now matters on how we will live then, then we should live in a, and pursue holiness, because we will get to see God someday. And as uh, children who want to be pleasing to their father. We live our lives in holiness, living for that day. The resurrection brings meaning to my religious pursuits. Thankfully, there's a better way to live, a way of life, and a way of hope for the future. And we need to surround ourselves with people that remind us of the coming life and inspire us to live this present life enlightened by what is ahead. We need people in our lives that will keep the truth of the resurrection in front of us. So when we're suffering, they can say God fully knows, and God will relieve your suffering someday. When we are struggling, God raised Jesus from the dead. And that same power that he raised Jesus from the dead is available to you to make it through. Whatever it is, it's in front of you. And when our loved ones pass, don't worry, you can see them again. The resurrection helps me now. It helps me now. Let's pray. God, help me to be a person who helps others, keeps focused on what's coming, not just on what's in front of us. My God, help me to remind people often um, about the resurrection, to, God, remind myself of the resurrection and his power in my present life and what's coming down the road. And God, help us to, um, help us get that right there in the, the center of our foundation. And um, God, I, I just pray that um, you would bring about encouragement to people who are struggling here. Uh, bring about um, just joy in our hearts because Jesus is alive and we will be alive as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.